Our guest this evening holds a bachelor's degree in American history and literature from the University of California at Davis. Go Aggies! And she studied creative writing at the University of California at San Diego, which are the Tritons? They are. Yeah. The Tritons. She has a master's degree in education of exceptional children from San Francisco State University, and I don't know their nickname. She has spent more than three decades teaching students with special needs from before becoming an elementary school principal. Her book tonight, we're talking about a lovely girl, The Tragedy of Olga Duncan and the Trial of One of California's Most Notorious Killers. It's a gripping true crime book, but it's also a very personal story, something she will expand on during her talk. It's gritty, it's well-researched, and if any crime, true crime book can be, can be thought of this way, it was written with a lot of love, and she'll talk about that later. Please welcome Deborah Holt Larkin. Thank you for coming to hear about my book, A Lovely Girl. Um, it's just, as you probably know, just being released today, and I can't think of a better place to start my book tour than here at Joshua's Books in Santa Barbara, Thank you. because this is where it all started on November 17, 1958. And also it started my road toward publication because I met my agent right here, Charlotte Gousset, at the Santa Barbara Writers' Conference because I, it seemed like a good place to look for an agent. So anyway, uh, I will start with the basic premise and give you some details about where people actually worked and lived here uh, at the time of the, uh, of the murder. Olga was a seven months pregnant nurse over at Cottage Hospital, and she was married to Frank Duncan, an up and coming uh, criminal defense attorney who had offices down on Lower State Street at what was called the Howard Canfield Building at the time. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's still there. Um, Frank wasn't living full time with Olga. He was having problems with his mother, Elizabeth Duncan. And uh, he, he had, she had threatened, she threatened to kill herself if uh, she didn't move, he didn't move back with her. And so Frank, dutiful son that he was, uh, he moved back with mom just a few weeks after he married Olga. And in on the trial, he testified that he thought, well, if he just could sort of keep things even keel until the baby came a couple months later, he thought his mom would come around, she would love the grandchild, and everything would just be great. Well, it, things she, she didn't get the, the grandchild was did not get born. Um, Olga was on was living on the garden at, on Garden Street at the Garden Street Apartments, and Frank would visit her, you know, once in a while in the evening. But on the night of November seventeenth, when Olga disappeared. Uh, she was, Frank was living with mom over at his mother's house. He said they were watching TV. And um, Olga had invited over a couple of her nurse friends from the hospital and they were having uh, hot buns, they said, and coffee. And Olga was showing them uh, baby clothes that she had been embroidering uh, for her unborn child. The friends left about 11.10 and Olga was never seen alive again. I'll read uh, the beginning of chapter two from my book to sort of set the scene. Can you speak up? Yes, I will try. <laughs> is, is, are you all having problems uh, hearing me back there? Yeah. Okay, I will speak up. Chapter two, the goodbye. The city of Santa Barbara is sometimes known as the American Riviera because of its beautiful coastline and almost perfect weather. But on that night, as a car moved slowly through the dark, empty streets, it was cold by local standards. The car stopped idling under a street light across from the Santa Barbara courthouse. The clock tower, its huge Roman numerals shouted in darkness, loomed overhead. The driver pulled out a heavy object wrapped in an oilskin rag from under the seat, examined it, handed it to his passenger, and then strained to get a look at the clock on the courthouse tower. 10 past 11, the car drove past low-slung, red-tiled buildings 
had headed through the shadowy darkness towards Garden Street. Three blocks away, Olga Duncan called out goodbye as her friends from the hospital clambered down the open stairway, still laughing at her friend's dead-on impression of their insufferable head nurse. Olga giggled and covered her mouth, glancing around at the dark windows of the neighboring apartments. She put a finger to her lips, shh, then she shook her head as she pointed toward the door of Mrs. Barnett, the manager of all Garden Street Apartments, who always referred to Olga as that sweet, lovely girl. Sylvia blew a kiss to her friend as the young nurses waved one last goodbye, turned, and stepped onto the sidewalk. Olga slipped inside the sliding glass door of her apartment, but didn't close it all the way. Instead, she leaned her hand on the glass and pressed her face through the partial opening to inhale the salt-scented air. The sound of a rough running car engine creeping along the road below ended Olga's reverie. Headlights swept past the deserted courtyard as she shut the sliding glass door, pulled the drapes, closed, and locked the latch. The sputtering engine abruptly died in the street. So you might wonder how, how would I know all of this? Well, Mrs. Barnett, who was in the apartment just below Olga, was listening to all of this noise. She was trying to get to sleep. She'd been reading her Bible in bed, and she heard all of this, uh, uh, this, this exodus and the goodbye from the nurses. Mm. So, so Santa Barbara detectives um, eventually took it seriously. At first, they thought, "Well, maybe this is a runaway wife, and maybe um, you know she'll be back." But after they talked to some of Olga's friends and uh, colleagues at the uh, the hospital, they heard that um, she was uh, getting threats from her mother-in-law, and that she was a very um, uh, unhappy about that, and so they, they began to take it very seriously and did a, a full-scale search for Olga, all points bulletin, all across California, and um, they actually started to, you know, uncover some, uh, some good evidence. One of the detectives at the, um, the Santa Barbara Police Department, a man named Charlie Thompson, uh, interviewed Mrs. Duncan's, who I refer to as her sidekick, it was Emma Short, an 80-year-old neighbor who accompanied uh, Mrs. Duncan all over Santa Barbara. In fact, all over Santa Barbara as she shopped for killers um, to get rid of her daughter-in-law. So when he talked to, when uh, Detective Thompson interviewed Mrs. Short, um, she spilled the beans and said, well, you know, she was trying to find someone um, to get rid of Olga, and uh, we eventually met some people at the, a tropical cafe and bar, which was down on Lower Market, uh, Lower um, State Street, and then she went into the details of what the plan was. So they were starting to. They still didn't have any evidence. They just had one person's statement. Um, Mrs. Uh, es Escoval over at the the um, tropical cafe denied everything. She never heard about it, and so. Um, but things progressed, and eventually. Um, Moya and uh, 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 Luis Moya and Augustin Maldonado were arrested for um, uh, on other charges, parole violations, and were in jail. And eventually, one of them led um, them to Olga's body, buried out on Casitas Pass Road. But it was just inside the Ventura County line. It was at the 6.9 mile marker, and there was evidence, and the killer uh, confessed that she was um, murdered at the spot. So everything shifted at that point to Ventura County. And that's why the trial wasn't here in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. Everything went down to Ventura. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you may wonder how, again, how I can write about all these events that happened almost 65 years ago when everybody is dead that was directly involved with the case except one man, Frank Duncan, who has always refused to talk about it. He says that was that was all in the past. I don't ever speak of it anymore. Mm. So everything had to be um, 
found, I found out to write this about by research, research. And I spent nine years researching this book. Um, my father, as I, I, maybe I didn't mention, he was a reporter for the Ventura County Star Free Press. He covered the trial from her disappearance, or covered her, the crime from her disappearance through the investigation, and then all through that trial. And um, he talked about it for the rest of his life. I, like, I think a lot of people, both in Santa Barbara and Ventura, he became sort of an expert. He was the only reporter that had been in every single court session of all three murderers. And uh, he, he was, uh, it, it was something that was kept alive to me by those, those, um, those talks. And so, like I said, I had his files. There were over 5,000 pages of uh, trial uh, transcripts. And really, th those transcripts, I felt like I was right in the courtroom um, while I was listening to this riveting testimony. Because this was, to me, by today's standards, very unusual that everybody testified. The, um, the actual killers of Olga uh, testified in excruciating detail about how they were hired, how they kidnapped her, how they killed her. Um, Mrs. Duncan is the one that maintained her innocence. She insisted that she was actually the victim here. She had a whole story about uh, how she was vic being victimized. Um, plus, another thing that I think was very helpful in writing this book is I had access to an unpublished memoir written by the district attorney in Ventura, Roy Gustafson, who tried the case. And um, it was just happenstance that I happened to know somebody who had this. And uh, he left it in his law library because he, he tried to get it published, but it, it was rejected, so he just he was done with it. And uh, it was kind of written in a very journalistic, dry way, but still I got a lot of insight into some of his trial strategy, what he thought about the, the witnesses and Mrs. Duncan and Frank. So that was very helpful. Uh, I also had uh, access to a couple of letters that Olga wrote to her family back in Canada that was describing her situation. And, um, and then I had all these newspaper articles. I, I spent to so much time going through the microfiche at the LA County Library, the Ventura County Library, the Santa Barbara County Library, and uh, read all of those articles. And it was kind of interesting to me because I read a lot about crime in the, the, the current, in the newspaper, and I don't think you see this much anymore, but these journalists, all of them, describe what witnesses were wearing, down to all the detail of their clothes, mm -hmm. what their hairstyle was, their demeanor on the, um, on the stand, and uh, then the, Sometimes the, uh, the, the DA or witnesses gave impromptu uh, press or interviews with some of the journalists at the court recesses and everything. So I had some of that information. So I'm going to read uh, a short uh, passage right here that will show you how I used some of these details uh, to write about the opening uh, day of the trial. Um, this is the first day of the trial, February 24th, 1959. The door at the back of Ventura Superior Courtroom 1 swung open, and a smiling, confident Elizabeth Duncan sashayed in like she owned the place. Her grand entrance was hindered only by the fact that she was cuffed to Mary Fogarty, a Ventura County Deputy Sheriff. Mrs. Duncan nodded and raised her fingers to a few familiar faces in the press crowd that she'd come to know during a, the week-long jury selection process. Reporters and photographs swarmed. How about a few pictures before we start, one of the news men called out. Mrs. Duncan's dapper little attorney, Ward Sullivan, nodded his permission and continued, and then continued a conversation with his private detective. Deputy Fogarty, dressed in a brown skirt and jacket with a sheriff star pinned on the front, unfastened the handcuffs. Mrs. Duncan stood next to her chair at the defense table and rubbed her wrists before turning towards reporters. Do you like my new outfit, she asked as she fluffed the skirt of her, her two-piece black and white dress with a Peter Pan-style velveteen trim collar. Frank bought it for me. Flash bulbs popped. So I know that because it was not only described what she wore and what she did uh, in uh, 
one newspaper, but in a number of newspapers. So I didn't just take what was said to the uh, in the newspaper, but I, I paraphrased it to mm. um, to to have a, to create a scene uh, from uh, about the, the the trial. If I may interrupt, that, yes, go Jennifer. right ahead. You've more than read and researched this, though. You lived this, right? I did. And you were about ten years old. I was. And you were obsessed with this. <laughs> yeah. yes. So if you could talk a little bit about okay. that. Right. Um, you know, I in, in 1958, in a couple of days, I think 19th, 20th of November, uh, my father, like I said, was a reporter and columnist, and he used to bring home lots of different newspapers. And I found on the dining room table uh, a copy of the Santa Barbara News Press that was folded and open to this little story about... Um, Olga disappearing from her apartment and being pregnant and uh, n n nobody had heard from her. And so I read that it was, you know, it was a pivotal moment, like, oh my God, someone can just disappear, vanish into the night? You know, what if that happened to me? Uh, and I was already, as you'll see earlier in the chapter, kind of a mm -hmm. uh, obsessive little girl <laughs> about danger. <laughs> I wouldn't tell. <laughs> I couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah. And so this really, you know, it hit me. And um, I began to follow the case. I would, every day, if I didn't see an article in the paper, I was asking my dad, well, you know, what's the latest on Olga? And he's like, you know, how the heck should I know? But, um, and then when it, it uh, all the story moved down to Ventura and there was the trial, he, um, he talked about it a lot, and I, again, I read everything. And I'm going to read just a real short thing about um, uh, that. Um, when I look back, Elizabeth Duncan's trial is linked inextricably in my mind to the sound of my father's voice, his dramatic, profanity-laced, sometimes humorous stories about witness testimony and crazy antics in the courtroom, stories of blackmail, a Salvation Army man, and a phony annulment, too many husbands to count and Mrs. Duncan breathing fire to the end, uh, denying her guilt. I read every word of his newspaper articles and I scrutinized the front page photos of all the trial participants, but it was my father's nightly accounts brought to, brought, that brought the bizarre and brutal characters involved in Olga Duncan's murder to life around our dining room table. Daddy had no filter. I hung on every detail of his spellbinding tales, and although I never met any of his people, I knew them all very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, he, he, people didn't read him in, uh, in the Santa Barbara, obviously you had your own newspapers, but he wrote a, also a very popular column that sometimes included stories about um, our family. Mm -hmm. So does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and he embarrassed you in some Oh, of right, columns. yes, I <laughs> could talk about that a little bit. <laughs> But I, you know, I, I have to ask though. Uh -huh. I mean, having lived this, yes. Obviously, this story was made for you to write. I felt like there were things. Yeah, um, your father originally wanted to do something. Right. He, yeah. when he retired, he always said that he wanted to write a book about the Duncan case, um, and he certainly was the guy to write it. But um, he died fairly young, at age mm. sixty-nine, suddenly. Uh, just a couple of years into his retirement, and he never got to write that book. So my, part of it is my dedication is to him because I feel like that, um, and also, he died so suddenly I never got to say goodbye. So I felt like this book was kind of my goodbye to my dad. Mm. It was dedicated to him. You put a lot of yourself into this. Half the book, I'm not giving it away by saying. No, go right ahead. Are, so are Deborah's experience childhood experience from her 10th year to her 11th year uh, and her intermixes perfectly with the actual trial itself. So you're not, you're not only getting a trial, a true crime story, you're getting her memoir as well. And it's, right. a, it's a wonderful piece and it's about your, you know, your father obviously is your favorite character and he's my favorite character in the book. And he is a so character. Human. He was a character. Yeah. <laughs> but all the people that you that you wrote about, like Higgins, the detective, Thompson, mm -hmm. uh, Ma Duncan, Frank, the, you know, the son, uh, Moya, Baldonado, they're all 
he made them all very human as opposed to criminalizing despite the things that they did yeah. and I wanted to know how you were able to do that because you knew what they did right you know I didn't I, I hope that I didn't uh, play down the brutality of their what they their murders oh, no, but I wanted to do that <laughs> Because, you know, maybe sometimes we think of murderers that they're just these heinous people that we ought to be able to figure out who they are. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they, there's an, another side to them. They have uh, another life. And neither of these men had, men had ever committed a violent crime. They were essentially uh, petty crooks, drug dealers, that kind of thing. And they just really, um, they said later in an interview that they... Um, they believed Mrs. Duncan, that she seemed like she, she knew what she was talking about and that they felt, and Moya said, we, I felt confident we could get away with this. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't like totally good, but there was interviews in a, a, a book that I read uh, called The Hired Killers, and um, he had interviewed some of their, their, you know, the teachers, both of them, and that meant something to me because I was a teacher for so long, mm -hmm. the principal. And uh, the, the teacher of... Uh, Augustine Baldonado said, you know, there's a lot of kids and they were just kind of left to run wild and he, she said they might as well have been raised by ro wolves at the, as much. But she says, I just remember Gus, is that who she, that's how they called, that's what they called Augustine, as this just nice kind of, you know, retiring little boy who didn't really say much. And then the teacher of Lewis Moya back in Texas said that, you know, she just couldn't believe it. She was just thunderstruck that she that he could be involved in anything like this because she remembered him as really gung ho, as a joiner. He was on the captain of the safety patrol. He was on the school's um, basketball team that won the county uh, uh, the county championship, mm -hmm. and he was a a a, a, a very um, nice and smart. He w he was until about sixth grade he was a decent student, but um, she said. You know, I just remember this sweet little boy in my class, and mm -hmm. I just can't put it together with somebody that would do something like this. So, you know, the, there's, there's two sides mm -hmm. to people, and that doesn't negate the horrible thing that they've done, but it's, um, I, I just thought that mm -hmm. people should know, you know all, about, all about everybody, at least as much as I knew. Mm -hmm. And the person we build the most is Mrs. Duncan. The, yeah, I didn't come up with a real, mitigating circumstance <laughs> on her. I, well, I, I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find much to, to say about that. When and, By the time you get to the end of the book, you're like, oh my gosh. Right. And that's what the DA said in his closing statements of the, you know, the penalty trial. You were supposed, in, the, in a penalty trial in California before they decide if you're going to be life imprisonment or face execution, the, the attorneys have the, the um, ability uh, to put on witnesses that say the good deeds that these people have done in their life and all of this. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in Gutterson's uh, summation, he said, there was not one person that came forward to say anything good about Elizabeth Duncan. The only person he testified for was her son. That was it. Wow. Yeah. And hence, she ended up where she ended up. Uh, yeah, right. The last woman executed in California. Right. So but yeah, I don't want to say anymore. No, we'll give away. I know it's, about Mrs. it's hard Duncan, to. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to. It's, it's about time to wrap it up a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, I've got a few more minutes. Okay. Well, well, I will say something then about how I. One of the ways I was able to write the family, what I call the family chapters about our chap, is my dad wrote a weekly column that he wrote about all kinds of stuff. Uh, anything that interested him, stuff that was going on in Ventura, stuff that was going on in the world, the country. But he also, many of those columns were written about our family. And it was sort of, I think many of you remember Irma Bombeck. I, mm -hmm. I used to say to people, they would ask me, what's your book? And I'd say, well, it's Irma ba Bombeck meets Anne Rule in Fargo. <laughs> and uh, so there was uh, a style, uh, there was a, uh, um, a style to my my writing of the family chapters that were a little bit kind of the the tone that my dad used to have, but uh, there he kept and as he mentioned, I was very embarrassed about some of the columns that he wrote about me, 
and about the family because you know kids are touchy and and children didn't bring it up it was other adults oh daddy your class, your dad is so funny yeah. i can't believe that he did this or this and i just want to you know yeah. fall, fall into a hole but what he yeah. saved many of those columns in a big black trash bag in the corner of his home office oh. and when he passed away um my mother gave them to me i asked i asked for them so, uh, and what a treasure it turned out to be. I read those columns again to refresh my mind about um, our family life. And this time, instead of being embarrassed, you know, I just laughed out loud <laughs> because he, he was a great writer and, and really a wonderful sense of humor. <laughs> and I, this one, uh, caught my, uh, this one uh, is something I thought worth mentioning. I, remind, I was reminded that he named his first lawnmower the Mrs. D, his p first power lawnmower, the Mrs. D after Elizabeth Duncan. Later, the Mrs. D chopped off the ends of two of his fingers when he was trying to get grass out from under the catcher thing without turning the lawnmower off. Blood <laughs> gushing from his hand, he screamed that the lawnmower was a homicidal, homicidal maniac. I thought it was very dramatic. So, you know, that was in one of his comments. So, uh, so I think I'd like to conclude by circling back to Olga because this is her story. Yeah. Her murder may have shattered my innocence and changed my view of the world forever, but the real tra tragedy is that a lovely, sweet, sweet woman named Olga Duncan um, was murdered. She did nothing to cause what happened to her. She wasn't reckless. She was just living her life. And the young DA who prosecuted the killers, Roy Gustafson, uh, said it well in his final argument to the jury. One of the pities of this case is that the girl who was so brutally murdered on the night of November 17th might have been any girl, anybody's sister, anybody's daughter. Any girl could have been the killer's victim if she happened to be to marry Frank Duncan. this collage, these pictures are, uh, most of them I believe are all in the book, but um, give a chance to people to look. I think Charlie Thompson's uh, picture is not in the book, and he was one of the uh, many police detectives in Santa Barbara who uh, investigated the case before it moved to Ventura. That's Frank on the witness stand testifying for, in his mother's defense, he was testifying for her. It's, that's, she only, he only had, she only had one defense witness in the, uh, the regular trial, and she only had one defense witness in the penalty trial, and that was Frank. And this picture, I think, captures a lot. Frank has got his head down, and Mrs. Um, uh, Louis Moya is on the stand uh, giving the detailed description of how they kidnapped and murdered uh, Olga. And he's got his head down like that, and a few uh, seconds later, he just scoots his chair back and, and bolts out of the courtroom. But when you see her look, I mean, she's so disgusted looking at him that he's upset about hearing what happened to his wife. Um, this was at uh, the, the verdict, I believe, uh, for the penalty trial. Uh, Frank's still standing behind her. He sat behind her at uh, the, the defense table for the entire time. This is Roy Gustafson. I think it's taken, that picture's taken a little uh, when he was a little older, but mm -hmm. this is the man who prosecuted, of course, Olga. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Duncan fixing Frank's tie. <laughs> this is my dad, uh, Bob Holt. Mm -hmm. And the two um, hired killers, Louis Moya and uh, Augustine Baldonado. And there's a whole story about that, too. Uh, and thankfully, AP, these are, uh, for the most part, Associated Press. On the back of their picture they had, Oh, they also have a caption, and they tell kind of what, what was going on when, when this picture was taken. And so this was after the arraignment, and they had all walked down, they walked down to the um, elevator for these three to go back to the jail, and uh, the photographer started snapping pictures, and Mrs. Duncan, you know, turned away and put her hand up, and Baldonado right up that said, said to her, what, are you ashamed of yourself? Because uh -huh. they had all already done it. I believe that's at the arraignment. And this is Mrs. Duncan's uh, very well-known defense attorney, uh, Ward Sullivan. He was a L.A. criminal defense attorney, and he had actually um, 
been part of the Barbara Graham, if anybody remembers that story, the I Want to Live movie, he'd, he'd been part of the defense um, team for one of the men in that case, and uh, Frank hired him to defend his mother because he wanted her to have the best legal representation. But reading the trial transcript, I'm thinking, what well, this guy's just phoning it in. I was just surprised at some of the some of the questions he asked and everything, but he didn't have a lot to work with. So, so anyway, if you get a chance, you can come up and uh, look at the pictures. There were a lot of surprising things. So, um, yeah. what what surprised you the most? You think? You know, you're right. There's a lot of surprise. I think. To me, one of the surprising things was Olga did not have to die. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few people in Santa Barbara, as I think I mentioned, that knew that Mrs. Duncan was looking for somebody to kill her. And nobody went to Olga, yeah. and nobody went to the police. And you know, if there's a lesson, you, you, we all need to speak up for someone who's in mm -hmm. danger. We need to watch out for each other. So that was one of the surprising things. So anyway, I know I talk a lot about some of the details, but believe me, this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and there's a lot more uh, information uh, about this uh, really scandalous 1958 case um, that was filled with dark humor and bumbling, brutal killers. Um, and I hope you all will want to read it. Uh, so we want to open up to you. Open yeah. Up to Does anybody have any questions, please? contemporaries because my father somehow or another was involved he was a, a defense attorney here in Santa Barbara mm -hmm. John Westwick I don't know if that ever came up in your research mm -hmm. but he worked with the lawyer Sullivan oh uh -huh. and I remember when you were talking about how you were a young girl yeah I presume and um, oh, really? your father coming home my and I remember being regaled by my father I, I don't remember his involvement in it but um, somehow or another, he was brought in as the mm -hmm. Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. and him telling the story, he uh, subsequently drove me by the mile marker on mm -hmm. Casita's Pass and yeah. showed me this is where yes, they is. murdered her. And I, I have been fascinated with the case, so I can't wait to read your book. Well, you know, <laughs> I have an idea of maybe how your father could have been involved, because before the body was discovered and they realized it was going to be a uh, Ventura case, um, the DA here in uh, Santa Barbara ha was getting ready to charge uh, Mrs. Duncan and the, the two men. He, even though he didn't have the body, he felt like he had information. So they were all set, like, you know, within days of when that body was discovered. So I assume they would have been getting lawyers uh, and getting uh, ready for I that. Could be. I just Barbara. don't, I was too young to remember yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. Any, anybody else have a question? Oh, yes. Have you thought of writing? Another yes, case. and if I and I have a, a, a kind of a plot in mind and written out some things, but when I write another book, it is going to be fiction. <laughs> I'm just going to write. The, I can just write, you know, whatever <laughs> comes to my imagination because I was very careful in this book to make sure that I got all the facts right. Because even though it's written in what they call a creative nonfiction style, that the it's a little the it's a little more of a novelistic when you're reading it. It reads a little more like a novel. But it's still, you have to get everything right. You have to write the truth. And so I, I think I'd love fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yes. It, it, regarding creative nonfiction, yes. what is the, the definition of that? Well, creative nonfiction is writing the truth in a literary style, is the simple thing. But the, it's not, I, they, I think they have what they call um, the nonfiction novel. And it's not that, because a lot of that people are, it, it's part fiction, part not. But it's writing proof of what happened in a, in, in a, uh, in a literary style and where you would create scenes based on information that you actually have, dialogue based on information that you actually have so that it, it, instead of a journalistic style, which a lot of true crimes are written in, mm -hmm. um, you, can, you recreate <coughs> scenes, you recreate dialogue, 
but like I said, it's all good because we weren't there for the video. Exactly. Exactly. So would that also include like changing people's names? I did. I just a couple of people. I changed a couple of people's names. The, the classmates in my class at school, I changed their names. Uh -huh. um, mainly, it was people in my memoir. I did create, um, and I checked to see that this was okay to be done. I have a composite detective. Char and most of the detective is Charlie Thompson, who was a real guy, and I had a lot of information on him. But the detective, um, Jim Hansen, is a composite. And I say in the notes of the reader in the front that he is a composite of all of the uh, Santa Barbara police detectives who worked on this case because there were so many of them. I just couldn't have all those different names. And so, but everything Detective Hansen says or does is something that I can verify that a, a detective in Santa Barbara. Okay, yeah. so it's important that it can be verified. Yes. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Anything else? No, you'd think that I would remember. This is my agent, Charlotte, to say <laughs> I just have to say <laughs> this. When I was reading this, the trial, I was rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. Some of the and, I, and I can't remember if you, did you say, did you trans, did you take it from the transcription? Right. The, There's the so trial? much in the trial. I could, obviously, I could not use all of it, but the, what they testify in, to, in, this, in, in my chapters of the trial, uh, came from the trial transcript. And I might have edited it for a little clarity or you know, grammar, so it's make it understandable, but essentially that, that was all there. So I was able to pick, you know, the stuff that seemed to mean the most. And uh, that's why I say uh, Irma Bonbeck meets Anne Rule in Fargo, because it's, it's dark humor is what it is. It's just really, you know, it, it does. When Mrs. Short is testifying, I mean, my gosh, she talked about a plot that Mrs. Duncan wanted to get Olga over to Mrs. Short's apartment and they would get her in front of the um, closet and then Mrs. Duncan would come out from behind and <laughs> strangle her and then they would hang her up in Mrs. Short's closet until, uh, Mrs. Short testified to all this, until um, uh, they could take the body away and, Mrs. and the DA said, well, uh, did you object to this? And she said, well, I certainly did. I wasn't going to have a dead body hanging in my closet all day. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> It's, you know, there's just, yeah, it was just, it was just. <laughs> so I can't wait for the movie. Yeah. <laughs> How many husbands did she have? Well, you know, it's a little unclear. But I've got <laughs> at least 12. Oh, no, I oh. thought there was 18. It could be. <laughs> and most of them that were alive testified a lot and of them were did. scared of you. Yeah, I have I'm some, scared. there's some testimony from uh, some of the ex-husbands in the, uh, yeah, she was a con artist, and she would con these guys into marrying her, and then when that happened, she started trying to get alimony and stuff, and she made up one child to get child support. She was a con artist. Well, she married one of Frank's friends, yeah, and somebody a generation younger than her. Right, one of his fellow law student oh classmates when he was, yeah. And that man lived to regret it. Oh my gosh, he just made his life And it's miserable. pretty certain that Frank was never, ever involved well, yes, the DA, when I read that memoir, he didn't, and he didn't like Frank Duncan. I mean, he really didn't like her because especially of, of leaving Olga, you know, on her own pregnant in that apartment, but, and for some other reasons. But he said that the, the case would have never been solved if Frank hadn't dragged his mother down to the Santa Barbara police station to file, you know, a complaint about that extortion, which just, Everything started to unravel after that. Um, but I think, you know, tr like I said, Frank Duncan was a criminal defense attorney, and uh, he had kind of that us against them mentality as far as the district attorney's office went. And um, I also think that he was trying to save his mother from the gas chamber. He didn't want her to be executed, whatever she did. Mm. But. You know, that's just after reading all of this and everything. And my dad thought that about he didn't want her to be executed. Mm. So, I don't know. You have to decide for yourself after you read that. <laughs> well, shall we sign some books? Yes. All okay, right. Great. Thank you very much, Deborah. And those of you who want me to put your name.